Now, Revelation 19, and I want you to look at uh, verse... Uh, look at verse uh, 17, and let me just kind of give you the gist of what we're, of what we're looking at here. In, in, in the previous verses, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, it's describing Christ coming down from heaven, riding on a white horse, and, and his saints coming after him, all white horses, and they're coming, he has a sharp sword coming out of his mouth, uh, it is two-edged sword, and with it, the final this is called the Battle of Armageddon. And we find out from an earlier chapter that the Antichrist and the false prophet and the dragon have already gathered the kings of the earth and all the mighty men of the earth and all the, all the uh, armies of the world. They've already gathered them in the valley of Megiddo, which is what this is, Ar Harma Giddo, Armageddon, and they've already gathered them there, and Jesus comes, and the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, I believe that's us, riding on white horses, and we're coming down, and we're going to do battle. And to me, it's not a battle that's going to take very long. It's a whooping, and it's over with. And so, notice then what happened after the battle, and I want you to picture this thing, pretend like this happened a thousand years ago. And there wasn't, you know, people that went out to clean up uh, from a, from a, like World War II, you had uh, corpsmen that went out and gathered up the bodies of, of allied uh, fighters that had been killed in combat and gathered their remains up and so they could have a proper burial uh, for them. Um, over there in Flanders Fields, by the way. But anyway, uh, picture a thousand years ago when nobody wanted to go out and nobody did go out and pick up all these bodies and bury them. What happened to them? Well, the birds, the vultures and crows and everything else and eagles would be flying around and when they see all this dead flesh laying there, they're going to go after it for sure. And that's what you see in verse 17. I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice, uh, saying, It's really hot in here! Those of you who read the verse with me will get that joke. I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he said, It's really hot in here. Okay, never mind. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings. Imagine this. Imagine that this happens in the next, let's say, 10 years. And King Charles is still king of England. And he has gathered his army out to the valley of Megiddo. And Christ, who is the king of kings and lord of all lords, kills King Charles and his royal, regal, touch-me-not body with all of his medals and all of his earthly titles laid out for the birds and the buzzards to come and eat the eyeballs out of his skull. Imagine that for a minute. That you may eat of the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Free and bond, small and great. So, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So here's why I'm bringing this up as you turn to Mark chapter 4. The story was in Peru that uh, a certain town 
that is populated by some of the indigenous people of Peru. In other words, they and their ancestors have lived on that land for thousands of years. And um, they have as part of their um, part of their boogeyman stories, they have a story of a monster that is, I don't know the, the Spanish term for it, but it is referred to as the face peeler. And these villagers, and we're talking the Peruvian news agency went out there, it was covered literally all over the world because these villagers were reporting that there were seven foot tall monsters that had come out of the forest. They were, they were on platforms that allowed them to move about anti-gravity um, and that they were totally impervious to bullets because the people uh, of that village, apparently some of them were well armed and there's, there was a lot of shooting going on, but apparently none of them, none of these monsters was hit or was in any way, uh, they, weren't, they were just impervious to the bullets. The bullets had no effect on them whatsoever. Um, one young lady, uh, they showed a picture of her, but they, which is what I should have done, they, they kind of blurred out where apparently her neck had been sliced right around in here. It's about 15 years old. Her testimony was that it was one of these all monsters that did it. Um, there was a video that, believe it or not, I found it on YouTube. I got it from YouTube, and I got it from a, a channel that's monetized, meaning this guy has more rules against, more rules that he has to follow than I have it's from YouTube, because I don't monetize my channel. But anyway, I saw he was giving comment about this particular video where they were pulling this guy from the bank of a river. And I have never seen anything like this in my life. His face literally was peeled off. And now, you understand, if you haven't studied much uh, anatomy before, that's fine. But our faces are full of blood. Okay? That's what gives us our facial color. When people see us, they can see and say, man, you look sick today. Why? Because you're there's not a lot of blood flow in your face. Boxers and MMA fighters. You know, I used to watch MMA a lot. And them guys that get kicked in the face one time and it looked like their heart was spurting out their nose, you know. Well, they would always explain, look, there's a lot of blood in the face. And, you know, that may not be too bad of a wound, you know. Of course, it's just going blue, blue like that. And they said, no, he's fine. He'll get over it. Um, this, this guy that they were pulling from the bank of the river, there was no muscle tissue, no sinew, no tendons, and no blood stains on his skull. None. The view was from the top left shoulder. The camera view was from the top left shoulder. So you're looking down at his left shoulder toward his skull and when the video first starts you can actually see under the skin his neck bone again with no blood no muscle tissue nothing there and the skin had been taken off and it was jagged there was hair here all the way to this side and then when they brought him up a little bit you, you could see the right side then you could see start to see some blood there on the right side of uh, his face and touching his right shoulder and his right arm so at one time there was blood there now um, is that video a fake it's 
possible. It's possible with video fakes now, with people that have the, and, and it doesn't take professionals anymore to make uh, some really, really, I've seen some really, really good computer graphics uh, made by amateurs that would just knock your socks off. I'm like, this is, this is Hollywood quality uh, CGI, all right? Uh, so it's possible that that is a fake, but is it, the question I have is, is it outside the scope? Is it outside the realm of the possibility of scripture? And I would say that it is and could very well be scriptural. We just read where at the, at the Battle of Armageddon, God calls all the fowls of heaven that fly in the midst of heaven to come down and get ready for this great feast that's going to take place right after this war. Because God knows he's going to win it. All right. Now, the reason why I told you to turn to Mark chapter 4 is the way the Bible gives us uh, and teaches us symbolisms. Um, in Mark chapter 4, verse 3, Behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. The fowls of the air. So in the parable part of the story, we're, we visualize seed falling outside of the garden and birth coming and picking up the seeds and eating them and flying off. Now when Jesus gives the description and what the symbol of the fowl of the air means, it's over in starting in verse 14 of the same chapter. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their heart. So automatically, Jesus tells us that the birds in the air can and do represent things that we cannot see. Spirits. Turn to Revelation 13 or 34. Take a pick. Revelation. Turn, turn to Revelation. No, I didn't say Revelation. I said Isaiah. That's what I said. Right? Everybody just agree with me. No one holding the Bible. Isaiah 13. This is the burden of Babylon. And it says uh, in verse 19, Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellent. These shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherd make their fold there. And the wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. And wild beasts of the and people say, see, that's why the Bible's not true, because there's no such thing as satyrs. Well, you just haven't seen one. But if God said they're true, if God said they're real, then God is right, and everybody who disagrees with God is wrong. And so here we have these creatures that I believe represent both earthly owls and earthly fowls of the air and so on. But they also represent spirits and they find their dwelling place in certain places and they eat. What's interesting to me is in the list of birds that God told the Israelites to know the difference between the clean and the unclean birds... Uh, clean, unclean birds in the list. You have eagles, you have the, um, you have owls mentioned, different types of owls, and and, and mentioned eagles. You have vultures and um, ravens and things like that. Any kind of bird that eats flesh and eats meat and picks meat off bones and things like that. God said those are going to be unclean to you. But the birds in the list that eat seeds, God said they're clean. Because they're not eating rotting flesh and blood. They're not eating flesh and they're not drinking blood. So is it possible that 
these people could have had an encounter with evil creatures that came and tried to literally devour them. I think the Bible allows for that. Now, um, let's take the time we have. I want to do something. I want to do this. Those of you following along at home, if you want to use your pure Bible search software, I don't know why, but this is one of the most important studies I think I've ever done. Just my own personal study, and I've, I, I've never really, I've never really gone through it all the years. I've never really gone through it, but it's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Now I've mentioned. Well, I'm getting a lot of. Uh, Busyness here. I, John, they're saying I'm cutting in and out. I, I don't have any control over it. So let, let me continue to teach. All right. Um, but anyway, um, what was I saying? Yeah, the day of the Lord. I know that uh, I've mentioned Second Thessalonians 2 quite often. Um, where he talks about the day of Christ is at hand. And some would say, oh, the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. That's not the same thing. Well, the Lord's Christ and Christ is the Lord. Why isn't it the same day? But I want you to notice this. Just, let's just take some verses. And not take them out of context. Let's, let's read what comes before and after these places where this phrase, the day of the Lord. So in Isaiah 2.10, enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For here it is, the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty and upon every one that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. Now, when I look at, look at verse 17, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, the haughtiness of men shall be made low and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. One of the reasons for the day of the Lord is to bring the haughty man, the prideful man, the arrogant man, the cocky man and woman to bring them down and humble them. And you know God's best way of humbling people? Humiliating them. You know, I love America. I love my people. I love Americans. But... You talk to other people about what they think about Americans. Oh, Americans are cocky. Americans are arrogant. Americans are... We are. We are very arrogant people. We think that we cannot be brought down. We think that we are the best at everything in this world. And I know a lot of men who would say, oh, Bring it on. America is America first. America this. America that. And God is just waiting for a day that he's already got picked that he's going to take and it's going to be the day of the Lord and those arrogant men are going to be brought down and they think they'll be able to fight. They'll think they'll be able to withstand. They'll think they'll be able to hold out. I'm here to tell you they won't. God won't put up with it. Isaiah 13, where we just read... How ye, always mentions it twice here. Look at this. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Why would a person, why would a man be howling? Why would someone be doing that? Huh? Fear? Pain? Death? People howl at their, at their looming death. When people know they're about to die. Listen, if, I, if you would have heard me, when that electrical current let me go, ask Matthew what he heard. I howled loudly, as loud as I could. When people howl, it is over fear, it is over pain, it is over anguish, torture. 
day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt. You think, and again, it does, I say Americans, but literally every man, woman, and child on this earth who thinks that they are stronger than God or think that God doesn't exist or thinks that somehow, some way that they have been good enough and God will accept them. Listen, they're going to collapse. Notice the next verse. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. Now, ladies, I'd be honest. I don't know what that feels like. But tell me, when you are having a labor pain, how well could you stand against it? No. So that's what's going to happen. And notice that he mentions the travailing woman, which links you right with 1 Thessalonians 5. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Same, it's the link, they're linked here. Isaiah 13 and 1 Thessalonians 5, hooked together, they're mated. Uh, they shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. And then that's where the stars of the heaven and the constellations, they're going to fall. Okay? Jeremiah 46. Let's back up, get a little context here. Mm, mm, mm. God is not happy. Who is this that cometh up as a flood whose waters are moved as the wind? Whenever, whenever you see the word flood, think of what Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah. Who cometh up as a flood whose waters are moved as the rivers. Egypt riseth up like a flood as waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up and I will cover the earth and I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Come up ye horses and rage ye chariots. See it? Pharaoh tried that once, raging the chariots. How'd that turn out for him? Not too good. I bet a lot of guys howled when they saw that water coming down on top of them. Uh, and let rage ye chariots and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries and the sword shall devour and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their what? Blood. Isn't that something? So literally on... On this skull, I, it, it would be like uh, uh, in universities or in, in some, uh, your doctor's office, a skull sitting on your doctor's desk sent to him by some company that makes, you know, s skeletons for doctors to show people. And this artificial skull sitting there all white and cleaned and shiny and everything like that. That's what was left. Of this guy's face his head I've never seen anything like that before um, and you know it mentions the Ethiopians and the Libyans and the Lydians and they're handling shields and bows and swords what army fights with bows and arrows None that I can think of. If they do, they don't, they don't last long. They don't last long. So, is this talking about another nation that God refers to as the Ethiopians and the Libyans and the Lydians? Who are handling a different kind of bow and a different type of shield riding in a different type of chariot. This is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate, and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath the sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Think about what he's saying, people. He's going to drink their blood. Ezekiel 13. 
Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, I know what Ezekiel 13 is. Ezekiel 13, God spent one day showing me a pastor, a preacher, Ezekiel 13, and God was saying, straighten up, Mike. Ezekiel 13, and I think Ezekiel 25 goes with it. It's I think both of them mention um, where um, they, built the, they built the wall with untempered mortar. In uh, verse 2, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. See, this is why you are going through hard times at times. This is why I'm, I go through hard times. And this is why I preach sometimes the way I preach and say some of the things the way I say it because I take the warnings of this Bible serious. And if God is training you and working in you, He's training you to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Remember what the evil day is in Ephesians 6, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But in verse 6, they have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. In other words, they say, God, Oh, God said this. But God said, No, I didn't. I didn't say that. I didn't say anything like that. But they've seen vanity. Vanity is... Van <laughs> I'm going to say it. Vanity was when you were... 21 and you walked by and looked at the mirror and said man you're good looking <laughs> boy that went away didn't it you're not 21 anymore the mirror's broke okay that's vanity and a lying divination the Lord saith, the Lord hath not sent them and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word so the day of the Lord is going to come down upon the preachers too. They're not going to get by with anything. Wicked, wicked, wicked preachers. This is uh, Ezekiel 30. The word of the Lord came again unto me saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus, thus saith the Lord God, How ye, there it is again, howling. Woe worth the day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. Notice now he's going to add something that, uh, I, like again, I've been seeing years ago, the, the cloudy day. The day of the Lord is a day of clouds. So when God said in Genesis 9, when I bring the cloud over the land, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. That bow is Christ, that he is coming in the clouds. That's what that was a picture of. When uh, Jacob gave Joseph his coat of many colors, he was showing forth Christ being glorified in the day of the Lord, being the bow, the many colors representing the colors of the rainbow. He is the bow in the cloud in the day of rain Ezekiel 1 where Ezekiel saw the rainbow over uh, the throne there and he said it, it was the the bow in the cloud and he said that was the likeness of the glory of the Lord and uh, Exodus 16 the Bible says and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud well Exodus 16 is where God sends them manna from heaven and they don't know what it is so it's Christ. And they, God sent Christ to the Jews and they don't know who he is. They don't know what he is. Um, but he was right there and they just, they just went, manna? That's what the word means. It means, what is this? Ethel, did you make this? 
I ain't eating it. Joel, look, turn to Joel. Turn your whole Bible to Joel. Turn the whole Bible to Joel. Look at there. Look at there. One, two, three, four, five verses in Joel where he talks about the day of the Lord. Alas, for the day of the Lord is at hand and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off before your eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God? Uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Notice this, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. And now look, at. I'm going to talk about this for a minute. This Joel's army thing. A great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like. It's not the Russians. It's not the Russians. It's not the Canadians. It's not the Norwegians. They're coming out of the north. But it's not any of them. It's farther north. Way farther north. Heaven north. Uh, a great people and a strong. There have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it. Even to the years of many generations, a fire devoureth before them. And behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them. And behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. We read that before too. That it's a day of clouds, a day of darkness, and nothing's going to escape. And there's howling. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen, so shall they run like the noise of chariots. There's the chariots again. On the tops of the mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame, a fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. Yet they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war and they shall march everyone in his Ways and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Sounds like what we heard from Peru the other day. Where they shot at them and shot at them and shot at them and shot at them, and they just wouldn't fall. Uh, in that same Pastor Mike Online yesterday, uh, I played an hour's worth of some of the best UFO videos that I could find. One of them was from, I think, Iran. And it was a night battle. The Iran military was shooting everything they had um, at this unknown aerial object flying around doing things that are physically impossible and I mean they had 50 caliber tracer rounds into the hundreds if not the thousands and none of them ever hit it none of them did um, and that's that's what you see right here then when they fall upon the sword they shall not be Wound. So our weapons of warfare, people, cannot be carnal. We have to fight a different way. We fight on our knees. We fight with our heads bowed. We fight with our eyes full of tears. We fight crying unto the Lord. We fight the fight of faith, believing and trusting in what God said in an hour and a time when it doesn't seem like God's going to help. Think about that for a while. Can, how long can you stand? Not very long. How long can God help you stand? Forever if need be. Mm -mm -mm. Now verse, uh, let's keep reading. Verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. I could, I could bring a young lady up here to this church and let her tell you 
her story of some type of small creature that had had been seen multiple times by her and her sister when they were young and she said even now it harasses her every now and then and she's born again incidentally but not accidentally at the time that this whatever this thing was that was harassing her and her sister and terrifying them greatly um, this young lady's father was molesting her sister at the same time wherever sin is the spirits are there and with the increase of sin in this world people you're going to see much weirder things okay and you picked me to be your pastor what were you thinking um, verse 11 oh no verse 10 the earth shall quake before them that's Revelation 6. The heavens shall tremble. Revelation 6. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. We already read that. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. and for his... See, he calls this evil devil group his army. And that's what, that's what threw me at first. But he calls it his army. In other words, he controls them. He's going to let them out and use them. So, if I said, if I said this, and this is just for everybody to think about. Do you believe that on some planet somewhere there's a civilization of, of uh, technological advanced beings that live on such and such planet somewhere outside of our solar system, maybe even outside of our galaxy. We've been told over and over and over, not possible, no, the Bible doesn't, there, that would be, then Christ would have to die for them, and Christ, and I've heard all of these things, and yeah, you're right. If, 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 they were like us, but they're not like us. It's an army that he's got waiting to come over uh, and they live up in the heavens where is the heavens um, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible and who can abide it and the, the point of that is listen if you if you're not covered and protected by the Lord Jesus Christ you will not make it look at this is what Peter preached Wow. I just thought of something. This is what Peter preached at the beginning of the church. What if, what if it's meant for the last day of the church here on this earth? I just thought of it. Verse uh, 30, I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. See, I believe God is going to use the Gentile bride to in some way uh, bring about the salvation of Israel. That's what I believe. Uh, and, and oh, by the way, back in Joel chapter 2, speaking of the Lord and the church, um, where is it? Speaking of the Lord and the church. 
Where was it? Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, blow the trumpet in Zion. Here it is. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Bride and the bridegroom coming together on that day. And when you compare this, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber to um, go to... Turn, turn your Bible to Psalm 19. The bridegroom is the son who goes forth, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And that's something. King James Bible. Doesn't get any better than this. Joel chapter 3. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Valley of decision. Why? People are going to make their choice, I believe. The sun and the moon shall be dark. There it is again. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now, again, I don't, this is not a different sun and moon withdrawal. This is the same one. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, man. That, uh, if you want to write a note there, write Revelation 10. Because you know what? The angel does in Revelation 10, which is where we're going in Sunday school. He roars like a lion. Okay. Revelation. Let me read it. Make sure I'm right here. The Lord here is going to roar. And in Revelation 10... And seven, uh, oh, verse, yeah. He had in his hand a little book open, verse 2, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. Now, again, I, I make this analogy. Here we have who I believe to be Christ, and he's roaring like a lion, and yet we have Satan, who is as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So the only way that you'll be able to know which is the right roaring lion is to be sober. Roy, amen? It's to be sober and be vigilant for your adversary the devil as a roaring lion. So here we have a roaring lion. Joel chapter 3, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Listen, when it starts shaking and getting, I mean, just as bad as it possibly can get. God's going to show up. Just like in a movie script you know they never write movie scripts where the hero saves everybody in the first 18 minutes of the film and the next hour and a half they're just talking about it right the guy the hero always saves everybody at the exact almost almost where they're almost dead boom he saves everybody and that's what's going to happen here well, I got to get on the road.